as the body of Christ, which is the topic for this morning. Um, and there's this one stanza that I, I really enjoyed, uh, which is uh, stanza four. It says, for this cause, we pray the Father God, strengthen thou with might our inner man. Make yourself at home in all our hearts. Root us, ground us in your love and for your plan. This, this stanza comes from Ephesians chapter 3, verse, uh, verses uh, 15 through 19. And in this, we see that the Apostle Paul was praying. He was praying for you and for me to be strengthened into our inner man. He was praying for us to be strengthened into our inner man so that what? We could apprehend with all the saints the dimensions of Christ. And this is not just, uh, you know, and it, it's not just an individual Christ, but this is, this is the corporate Christ. This is the body of Christ. So he was, he was on his knees praying for this. Uh, this is, this is, a, this is a huge matter in, in the matter in, in, in the entire revelation in the Bible. Actually throughout this series of messages, we've seen that God has a purpose, that God is a God of purpose and that he desires to gain something on this earth. Now, this is not something that we can really see uh, with, with our eyes. Actually, it requires, uh, with our, sorry, with our physical eyes. Actually, you know, on the one, one hand, we have the church. Uh, maybe you grew up going to church meetings. I, I grew up going to church meetings. And, and so I saw people meeting together, which is one aspect of the church. And that was brought out in previous weeks. Right? This is the gathering of those called out, those that have the life of God. Uh, but, but there's something even deeper. There's something more, there's something more intrinsic. Uh, that is something that, that, that requires us to see something uh, more than just on the surface. It, 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 it comes back to this, the nature, the constitution of that thing. And, and so with the church, we have to see there's something, there's something deeper than just people that are of like mind meeting together or even that have uh, the same life meeting together. There's something deeper than that. And so I just, I, anyway, I, I was considering this week what, what, to, what to even say. I, I'm not sure. Anyway, I, I really wasn't sure what to say, but I was, I was reminded of, of these verses uh, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse uh, 18. It, it says, because we do not regard the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal, right? So we have to be transferred. I realized I needed to make a transfer from just seeing things that were in, this, in the physical realm to things that are in the spiritual realm. And, and so I just, I, I don't, any, I, I'm not sure exactly how to present this, but I realized when Jason opened up the first message in this series, right, uh, that we need to have our hearts straight toward God, that our heart needs to be turned toward the Lord. Like Dan said, we need to turn our heart to the Lord. Uh, then we can be unveiled. And the Apostle Paul also, not only did he say this in, in Ephesians chapter 3, but in Ephesians 1 earlier, he was praying that the Ephesians would have the eyes of their heart enlightened. And so this morning, we also, we also, I, I also, I need my heart, the eyes of my heart to be enlightened, that I may see, that I may see what? What am I seeing? I'm seeing God's purpose. I'm seeing God's will, which is the church, the church as the body of Christ, the church as the body of Christ. And I'm going to be referencing a lot from Paul's epistles because Paul had a particular experience. Paul, uh, he you know, I, I don't know if you know anything about the Apostle Paul, but Paul was actually named Saul at a certain period of time. Uh, and, and I'm going to walk, walk through uh, some slides here. It's a very short presentation, but Saul, it says he was the top. He was one of the best in Judaism. You know, he knew the law. He was, he was you know, of all the people, you know, that, that, that could have been written down in Acts. When Stephen uh, one of the stewards that was in the church in Jerusalem was stoned. They, it, it said they laid, the people that stoned Stephen laid their garments at the feet of Saul. Uh, he was, he was, I mean, he was kind of the leader in all of this. And he saw the law. He was zealous. He said he was, he was exceedingly zealous for the law. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. I mean, or, or, sorry, he was a Hebrew of Hebrews and he was, he was to the zeal a Pharisee. This is in, a, in Philippians. And so he, he was just the top guy. 
He, he, he knew the law in Judaism, and he thought he was serving God by following that law to a T. And he would, you know, because people would call in the name of the Lord. This is after the Lord died on the cross. And people and, and the disciples had received the Holy Spirit, uh, in, you know, breathed into them in John chapter 20. And then the Spirit had been poured out in Acts, chapters, uh, in Acts chapter 2. Okay, there were people calling on the name of the Lord all over the place. And Saul was like, this is not right. This is wrong. So he's like, I'm going to kill all these people. And so he's, it says in, in uh, Acts that he was breathing out murder against those who call upon the name of the Lord. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to read the verses. <clears throat> this is in Acts chapter 22. And it says, it says he, he's describing his own experience here. He said, I persecuted this way. That is the way of those calling on the name of the Lord. Christians, I persecuted this way unto death, binding and delivering to prisons both men and women. So all believers at this point were under, under Saul's persecution. And so Paul, or sorry, sorry, Saul, it's the same person. Saul, when he was, you know, because he was so zealous to complete these things in the law, he decided, you know what? I'm going to go to Damascus. I need to persecute more Christians. So he was on the way to go persecute Christians. He had letters from the high priest giving him authority to do, uh, you know, pretty terrible things to the Christians, those that called upon the name of the Lord. And Saul, he, he didn't consider like, oh, I mean, I'm just going to, you know, take these people. They're just weird. They're calling on the name of the Lord, all these different things. They're not doing it right. I need to, I need to kill them. And so he, <clears throat> anyway, he's heading to Damascus. He's heading to Damascus. Okay. And, and this is, this is what, this is what, this is what happens. This is kind of amazing. Okay. And as I journeyed, this is Paul speaking, and drew near to Damascus about midday, suddenly a great light flashed out of heaven around me. And I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? He didn't say, the Lord didn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting my believers? He didn't say, Saul, why are you persecuting the people that call on the name of the Lord? He said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? This must have had an incredible impact on who the, the, the man that would later be called the Apostle Paul, right? Paul. Because only Paul wrote concerning the body of Christ. He saw this fact. I don't know exactly where, but he must have realized there was something here when the Lord appeared to him in a light brighter than the sun and said, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You know, th this, this, this fact is, is, is huge. So we're going to get into this a little bit more. I just want to, you know, introduce this subject. You realize Paul or Saul saw the, the outward things. He saw the people meeting. He saw the people calling on the name of the Lord. These are all things that are actually, they're there. They're real. But, but here we have something that's deeper. We have something deeper concerning the church. It's not just a gathering, but actually this is the body of Christ. You know, if you look at me and, and, and it, you know, I, I'm here. I mean, you can't really see the rest of my body. You only see like from the top up. But, you know, if you consider it, right, like if, if, if I was to be punched like somewhere on my shoulder, you know, like I, I wouldn't like be like, hey, hey, stop hitting my shoulder. I'd be like, hey, 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 stop hitting me. Stop hitting me. And so here we, we see Paul must have seen something that he realized, wow. I'm persecuting believers, but that persecuting of believers is actually persecuting the Lord Jesus. And so here we have, here we have something concerning the body of Christ. Now, <clears throat> let's go back to the purpose of God, right? Let's go back. God, right? The infinite God, he, he, he has a will. Uh, and I'm going to start sharing my screen here. Um, and just share some of these verses here. He has a will. He has something he wants to uh, accomplish. 
And in Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, right, uh, there's, there's this praise going to, to the Lord Jesus. And, and they say, because of your will, they were and were created. So here we have a key, a key uh, description concerning what's going on, right? There, God has a will. He has something he wants to accomplish. But it, it's hidden. It's hidden. It's, it's, not, it's not clear what it is. It needs a revelation. And so Paul, he received a revelation of this will. And in Ephesians, he wrote concerning this. You know, a lot of the references we're going to be going through today are in Ephesians because Paul, he spoke a lot about this here. He says in Ephesians chapter 1, 9, he says, making known to us the mystery of what? His will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Okay. Again, the will is being made known. Again, the will is being made known. We need to see God has a will. He's a God of purpose. You know, the infinite God became a finite man, right? We, you know, we saw, we see this in Matthew chapter one, right? When we've got the story concerning the incarnation and birth of the Lord Jesus. And, and, and then as you step through the gospels, you see the Lord Jesus, you know, this is God in, manifested in the flesh, walking around on the earth. He is, he's there real and then he what he had this perfect human life and then he accomplished judicial redemption on the cross so he he's passing through uh, you know human living and, and he died for our sins we know this you know and then he he in you know when he died he was buried and then he was resurrected on the third day right and so this is this all has a purpose right it says in resurrection he became the life-giving spirit and then he was ascended, he was enthroned, you know, he's, he's enthroned. Todd brought out, you know, last week, you know, in one sense, the kingdom of God, you know, the Lord Jesus is enthroned. He's also within us, right? He's coming to us to rule and reign within us by his life, by the spirit of life that is now in our spirit. But now he's there enthroned. But this all has a goal. This all has a goal because God is a God of purpose, and this goal is the church as the body of Christ, the church being the body of Christ. And, and we, we can really see this here in Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. And I'm going to read the verses reading, leading up to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, which starts at 19. And this is in the middle of a sentence. And what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the operation of the might of his strength? which he caused to operate in Christ in raising him from the dead and seating him at his right hand in the heavenlies, far above all rule and authority and power and lordship and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. 22, and he subjected all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things. And it continues to the church which is his body, the fullness of the one who fills all in all. So God, he, he, you know, he became a man, he died, he resurrected, he ascended, he was enthroned so that now he can transmit all of all the riches to the church, which is his body, the church, which is his body. This is what the church is. It's, it's the body of Christ, the fullness of the one, who fills all in all, right? And so Paul repeatedly spoke about this, right? These verses in Acts 9, 4, and 5, I, I kind of already touched on these. This is Paul's first, you know, description of his experience concerning uh, what happened at that time. Actually, he, he's not really even describing it. It's being written about him, right? And they say, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me, right? Again, he must have seen something concerning the body of Christ there that he was persecuting believers, but these believers were actually part of his body. They were part of Christ's enlarged expression. Uh, and so, all right, we have kind of this view. God had a purpose. He had a plan. 
And he wanted a group of people to express him on the earth, to bring about, to exercise dominion and to accomplish his will. And so he passed through different processes so that now he could, you know, he could constitute his members and he could make them his body. And now he's filling us. He's filling us. And, and, and so he, he, we're actually being filled unto all the fullness here, the fullness of the one who fills all in all, right? Uh, this is kind of a mysterious statement. Honestly, we'd need a lot more time to just talk even about this statement. Uh, but I just, I, was really, I just really want to impress you all again to see this is something concerning the body of Christ. This is something where God is now filling us with all the fullness, right? All these things that he passed through are now to us, to the believers, you know, making us members of his body, causing us to grow in life. Uh, we are not separate from our head, right? In Ephesians chapter five, uh, you know, it talks about Christ being the head of the church. You know, Dan, uh, a couple of weeks ago, talked about the church as the counterpart of Christ. Uh, the church is, is one with Christ and Christ is the head of the church. In the same way, the church is also, uh, it's, it's the body of the head. It's the body of Christ. These are all things that describe what the church is to Christ. Uh, and so, you know, you might be thinking, well, okay, what, what's, why, why are there so many descriptions? Well, it's just that this thing is, is too marvelous for, for us to really understand. So we have to see uh, these, uh, the church from these different aspects. And we really need to see that the church is the body of Christ. Okay, moving on. Um, <clears throat> we have our last slide. We have the enlargement expression of Christ. This is, you know, Christ, he's unlimited. He's, I mean, this is, this is the unlimited God. And now he's dispensing himself. And what happened, right? We can see a good picture of this uh, and what uh, this expression should be in Acts. Now, um, this is before Saul persecuted the church, just in terms of the timeline. Uh, but after the Lord Jesus died and he, he was with the disciples, as he ascended to the Father, he said, go therefore, disciple all the nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is at the end of Matthew. Then he, you know, he indicated the disciples, go into Galilee and wait there uh, for the Spirit to be outpoured. Uh, and they were there and they decided, you know what, let's just start praying. They received the spirit inwardly as their life. Uh, and they, they were waiting there in Galilee for the spirit to be outpoured. And so when, okay, so that when they were praying there for 10 days, coming into this one accord, being filled with the spirit, then suddenly, you know, the spirit was outpoured. They gave the first gospel message recorded in Acts chapter two. Peter stood there and 3000 people were saved. 3000 people were, were brought into the body of Christ. They were baptized. And these people then were there. Okay. So we had started with one man on the earth, the Lord Jesus. He, he, you know, he was the single grain that fell into the ground. And then with that first gospel message at the day on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 believers were then produced. What were they going to do after, after being regenerated, after receiving the life of God? You know, they, they've now received the life of God. They've been brought into the body of Christ. And, and so what did they do? Well, they, you know, they just started meeting. They just started meeting, right? Because they're enjoying the riches, the fullness of the one who is now in them who's now growing in them. And so in Acts 2, 42 and 40, through 47, we see they were meeting day by day, right? They were, they were breaking bread together. They were praying together. They were, you know, there was, you know, some ministry of the word. There was fellowship together. You know, they were just coming over to each other's house, you know, enjoying this wonderful Christ who is now their life, who is now, you know, anyway, they, they've now been brought into the body of Christ. They were members of the body of Christ. This is not some sort of outward membership, but actually even, you know, Paul wrote that 
they are members. Uh, members, sorry, I'm gonna read the I'm gonna read the verse in Second Corinthians. They were members one of another. Uh, and sorry, First Corinthians chapter twelve. Here we go. <clears throat> The members are many. I've got many members. They're all one. So all these, all these saints, all these ones that have been brought into the church were now, there were many of them. They were all one body in Christ. And it says in 1 Corinthians 12, 12, for even as the body is one and has many members, yet all the members of the body being many are one body. So also is the Christ. Then, right? We have to see these ones, they were all meeting together. They were all there together, enjoying the same Christ. They were different from each other, but they were one. They were different from each other, maybe just who they were as persons. But now because they had received the life of God and because they were enjoying this life, because they were receiving the riches from the head, they had this view. I'm, I need to meet with other members. I need to enjoy the fellowship with other members uh, because they were just, anyway, they were, they were enjoying this life and that really ushered them into living in the body of Christ. Uh, this is something very mysterious. Anyway, when it comes down to it, I just want to leave us with a, a, two practical points. That is one, this is in our spirit. We need to, we need to exercise our spirit so that we can see this. And, and two, we, we need to, we, you know, we need to meet together because it's in this meeting while something it's extrinsic, it's something that we can see physically, it actually leads us and enables us to be in the fellowship so that we can enter into what is written here in the Bible, which is the, you know, the exercising of our function in the body of Christ uh, for, for the growth of the body of Christ for the accomplishment of God's eternal purpose. So anyway, I, I, I really enjoyed getting into this. I hope something got through. Um, anyway, praise the Lord for, for his plan and for the body of Christ. Thanks, Dan. Pass it back to you all. Okay, thank you, JR, for such a wonderful word. On the church as a body of Christ, I'm so impressed again to see, wow, when Saul was persecuting the believers, the Lord appeared to him and said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Me, not uh, not the believers. So that's an implication, right? That actually we are one. We are one with Christ. Actually, the body of Christ is just an extension of Christ himself. And knowing that, that we are an extension of Christ, uh, there is a need, right, for this body to continue to grow and to be built up together. I enjoyed JR's uh, couple practical points at the very end there, that what do we need to do? We need to be those who are in spirit, in spirit. What that means is that we need to be those who just contact the Lord, right? We need to be those who come to the Lord in our spirit and also very practically, we need to be those who come together, right? That was what the uh, disciples and the early church, that's what they were doing. Every single day, they were coming together to meet. And so this is very practical for us. I hope uh, what we can take away from this message is, you know, as a body of Christ, as we realize this, that we need to be those who need to come to the Lord continually, but also we need to come together, come together as a church, as a body, every day, every day. Amen. Okay, so what we'll do now is we will be breaking out into rooms, but before before we do that, I'd just like to make an announcement. Uh, in two weeks, okay, I believe it's in two weekends, uh, we will be having another college conference. I know some of you uh, did attend this conference back in the fall. We will be having another one uh, for the spring semester. So this will take place March, I believe March uh, 12th and 13th. It's a Friday and a Saturday. Okay, Friday night, we'll have a gathering and it'll be virtual again, it'll be over Zoom, uh, but we will be planning to do all of these uh, watch parties and uh, just like we did last semester. So uh, more details will come, but just mark that in your calendar, uh, Friday, March 12th 
and Saturday, March 13th, uh, we will be having another college conference where college students from all over the Midwest will be gathering together to be just like this morning, to just to be under God speaking and just to encourage us, just to continue to encourage us um, in our going on with the Lord. And so go ahead and uh, uh, you, you, more information and the registration is actually on our Instagram or also on our app. And so uh, please go ahead and begin registration there. Uh, we'll, we'll send out more information uh, coming very soon. And so I think with that, uh, we can go into our breakout rooms and just continue our fellowship. What impressed you during this message? Uh, just say hello to one another, and then, and then we'll be on our way. Amen. Okay, brothers, I think we can go into the rooms now.